Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to meet you again after after a while away, and, and thank, I have to thank to to Laetitia and Bia to to have me or to allow me to introduce Michael Kearney, since I was very very keen to have him around to give us this seminar. So Michael Kearney is a professor in ecology and evolution in the School of Biosciences at the University of Melbourne, and apart from many many articles relating ecophysiology, ecology, and biogeography of species, he has developed the Niche Mapper package, which it has allowed to many researchers across the world, including me, to be able to model the ecophysiology of a species with unprecedented detail. So uh, I thought that he would have super interesting things to tell us, uh, especially given that the, that the EBD is now so focused towards climate change. Uh, and I hope that you can enjoy the, his seminar. Mike, very pleased to, meet, to have you here. Thanks, August. Really nice to, to meet you finally and to um, to be here to talk to your your group. Um, and I'm really sorry I'm not there in person. I really enjoy being in Spain. It was the first country that I went to in Europe um, back in 2004. I went to Valencia and uh, fell in love with your food and your whitewashed buildings and, and landscapes. Really love being in Spain. Maybe I'll be back there soon. Um, but you'll have to put, yeah, make do with the, with another Zoom. Um, but yeah, what I'm I'm going to tell you about um, this thing called ecological or well, mechanistic niche modeling, um, modeling the ecological niche and mapping it um, from first principles, and uh, it allows you to make predictions of species distributions, and that's called mechanistic species distribution modeling. But it also allows you to do more than that because it's getting at the processes underlying uh, what constrains organisms to different environments. And so by understanding those processes that are happening at the scale of individual organisms, at a, you know, sort of hourly scale in their, in their microhabitats, it allows us to um, better understand what they're doing and how to manipulate, how to modify, how to manage uh, species in landscapes, especially as the climate changes. So many of you will be familiar with species distribution modeling and the notion of ecological niche modeling. And this, this whole um, endeavor has really taken off because of gridded environmental layers, like these maps you can see here on the left. And actually, interestingly, those gridded layers were first developed in Australia uh, for reasons I'll mention a little bit later. Once we had these gridded environmental layers of climate or soil or some other kind of environmental feature, um, the first thing, people started to do was to take um, the occurrence records of species, places we know they occur, to basically query all those layers for what the environment's like at those places, and then using increasingly sophisticated methods, characterize that environmental space, and then project it on back onto the landscape so that we can see where places are suitable, where we don't we have information about the environment, but we don't have information about the distribution. So this is known as correlative species distribution modeling. This really captivated me when I was um, a, a, a student, a, a young student. I, I loved the, the notion of this and, and was using it in my own research early on. So these are a couple of species distribution models uh, I made with a generalized linear model approach um, for some unusual species from Australia that reproduce by parthenogenesis. They're all female species. A grasshopper on the left called Waramaba virgo and a, a gecko on the right called the binos gecko. And uh, this was a very powerful uh, way of looking at their distributions. They, they evolved relatively recently and expanded across Australia. Um, and the grasshopper we, we know evolved over in the West and expanded across this area where they're no longer present because it's a treeless plain all the way over to the East. And the gecko also expanded from the West to the East. And you can see these models of predicting places they haven't quite made it to or that they might've been lost from. Very powerful ways of looking at environment um, organism relationships. During this time though, I started to think about the niche concept and I started to think about what, did I really understand what it was? And in particular, did I understand what the niche was in relation to two other fundamental concepts that were being used in this context, environment and habitat. So people were talking about environmental niche modeling, habitat modeling, and I was thinking about these terms and um, I felt a little bit embarrassed actually, because you know I was a, at the time a PhD student, and I didn't have clear in my own head what these three fundamental concepts meant in relation to each other. But I chatted with my colleagues uh, you know, at the time and, and I know, realized we were all pretty pretty vague on this. So I, but, but I thought about it and came up with a, a way of thinking about it that at least worked for me and for thinking about 
the niche concept in relation to understanding species distributions and environmental constraints. And uh, it's sort of a nested way of looking at it. So um, starting with, so here's a, here's a scene out in, in the desert in Australia, in Western Australia, where those all female um, species live. Um, and if, if we describe this place, the, the first concept habitat we can use without any reference to an organism, we can simply describe the physical arrangement of objects in space and time. So I've defined habitat here as a, a physical place at a particular scale of space and time where an organism either actually or potentially lives. We don't need an organism to be there to describe the habitat. So here um, we have a, a, a desert habitat. So you might describe it as having um, highly variable rainfall from, from year to year, uh, very um, extreme changes in temperature through a day, quite open, a lot of open ground, sparse vegetation. Um, and, but I haven't necessarily referred to, referred to a particular organism. But um, in this environment, we, in this habitat, I should say, we, we have organisms. And, and the concept of environment um, really, uh, it means, uh, environment means to surround. And so when we're talking about environment, we must be talking about an organism. We cannot talk about an environment without talking about an organism. And actually, the organisms themselves construct their environments in a very real sense. So if you think about those two animals that I, I, I showed you, the two cloning species, the, the grasshopper and the gecko, the grasshopper actually feeds on these um, acacia bushes and lives up high off the ground. The gecko runs around on the ground. And so in the same habitat, these two species have very, very different environments, especially in terms of their, the air temperature and the wind speed. Uh, even more so, uh, the gecko is actually coming out at night, um, whereas the grasshopper is just always out during the day. The, the gecko is coming out at night and then retreating underground during the day. And then we have another, another reptile running around under those bushes um, during the day, the grey skink. Um, so it's, it's still living on the ground like the gecko, but it's experiencing a completely different environment um, to the gecko just because of its behaviour, being nocturnal versus diurnal, the grasshopper foraging up high in a tree and staying in the tree. Um, and right now, um, you're all creating environments around yourselves just because of the effects of your own physiology on the environment around you. So you're creating a little boundary layer of warm, moist air around your bodies. And so organisms are really um, constructing their environments and the concept of environment needs the organism to be um, part, of that, part of that notion. So you can think of the environment then as the biotic and abiotic phenomena that are surrounding and potentially interacting with, a, with an organism. And you can see it, I've nested the environment here within habitat because um, you know, environments are constructed out of habitats. And then finally, the niche would be the subset of those environmental conditions that actually affect the organism's fitness, affect its potential to survive and reproduce. And so um, we can think of that as a further subset within the, habit, uh, within the environment. It's those aspects of the environment that affect the organism's fitness. And so the conditions where uh, the organism's niche would be those that set of those particular conditions that allow the organism to actually persist um, as, a, as a surviving individual and ultimately for the for populations to persist for the births um, to, to outnumber the deaths or at least balance them. So that's the, the way I end up thinking about these concepts of habitat, environment and niche. And then if you think about how to model species uh, niches from that perspective, we need to start with the actual organism itself. So not with the distribution points, but with the, the traits of the organism, some linking that to the environment they actually experience and trying to then infer whether or not the organism is able to grow, develop, survive. What is, what is its, um, its fitness in that environment? So that whole scheme is what you could see as being a mechanistic approach to modeling uh, the ecological niche, starting with the traits rather than the distribution and then mapping that characterised niche from the linkage between the functional traits of the organism and the environment to space to see where we imagine, well, where we predict the species to occur. But how do we do this? There are so many processes uh, that we could consider when trying to mechanistically model a species niche, a bewildering number of them really. But one good place to start um, is with thermodynamics. And I never um, did any physics when I was uh, high school student or, or a, um, a uni student, 
Um, I didn't think I, I needed any physics, I needed to understand something like thermodynamics to understand organisms, but I've changed my mind on that. Um, I think it's a really powerful way to understand the constraints on organisms. And organisms are very unusual um, compared to normal physical objects in that they are highly complex structures that uh, should, should really fall apart, all else being equal, because in, in the world, uh, things generally move from a state of, of, of order to disorder. That's the second law of thermodynamics, that, that, um, that entropy tends to increase in the universe. So the, an, an organism is, is sort of needing to swim against the entropy tide. It's, it's maintaining itself as this very complex entity, um, but it's because there are a whole lot of processes that are continually going on in that organism. So here's a little picture of a, an organism. It's a bit uh, low resolution. It's, a, it's an image I took with a, uh, an infrared camera. This is the visible portion and it's a military dragon, a little dragon lizard that you find running around out in the open um, in the deserts of Australia. And this is the infrared image of that, of that lizard. And you can see that it's, it's warmer than its environment. There's actually exchange going on of heat between the organism and its environment. Also, you might be able to notice you can see the eye on this lizard. And um, that's because it's, I've got a wet eye, the surface of the eye is wet and it's evaporating. So there's mass exchange going on as well as uh, heat exchange in the form of energy. Uh, in general, what we're doing in thermodynamics is we're drawing a boundary around some part of the universe and we're following the flow of energy um, or mass in and out of that system. So we have the, the system and, and the surroundings and, and organisms really naturally are um, a system boundary for considering in thermodynamics. So the organism is the system and the surroundings are the environment. And we can follow those flows of energy and mass in and out of the organism. And by looking at the organism this way, we get a very fundamental picture of um, whether or not that organism can survive in a particular place. Because although, you know, predators might come and go, competitors might come and go, diseases might come and go, these laws of thermodynamics are always present. And so if we can understand those as a starting point, we're going to be able to um, say a lot about where a species can and can't occur and sort of bound the problem uh, to, a, to a simpler problem than if we just started with say competition or predation from the start. Um, so you can see this um, prism here, it's a bit like Pink Floyd album cover, drawn by a, a past student of mine, Aaliyah Pertle, who worked on this and, and, and came up with this image to explain the, the process of understanding a species uh, in, this, in this thermodynamic perspective, where we can see these flows of heat, um, we can see these flows of water in, in the right-hand side, um, the animal's breathing, uh, the animal's feeding, it's taking water in, it's doing these, it's relating to these three terms here, the, the temperature of the animal exchange through respiration, water exchange and feeding. These are the fundamental aspects of life. These are the things you would think about if you were stuck out in the desert um, and, uh, and lost. And the reason I've used these particular words is you can stick them together in this particular way, which actually reflects the underlying physical connections between these processes. Um, and these encapsulate what I sort of think of as the, as the thermodynamic niche or a mechanistic characterization of the niche from thermodynamic principles. And the underlying terms look a bit, a bit more complicated they look like this. Basically, it's a series of, of budget terms. Where it's sort of like a bank balance. It's actually not that you know, difficult to think about if you think of it as a bank balance, where we have a heat balance here. That's the temperature term. Um, we have a balance in terms of um, what's going in from the food and how that's being used in green. We have a balance of water here in blue, and we have the, to the breathing balance in, in brown here. And if you look at these different terms, say with the heat balance, we have things that should be relatively familiar to you, like heat coming in from solar radiation. Um, there's heat being exchanged by convection. There's heat being exchanged by conduction to the ground. Um, there's also heat being produced by the metabolism and there's heat being lost by evaporation. And you can see these terms of evaporation and metabolism have these circles around them. And that's because they're in a combined exchange of both energy and matter. So with evaporation, we have the exchange of water at the same time. So that connects to the mass budget of water. There's water being evaporated from the surface of the animal's body, including the eye, but also um, from when the animal's breathing through respiration. 
And then obviously um, the metabolism connects to the food because the, it's, the, it's the energy in food that's being used to run the metabolism, but then the heat's being released from that process. And so we have this connection between the energy and mass budget, um, both uh, in the heat in the, and in the water context. And then there's another, this other aspect of the mass budget, the breathing connects to what I've called breathing, connects to metabolic rate, because basically we have this you know, the, the equation relating to the Krebs cycle here where the sugars are being used to generate the heat to, to run the metabolism, oxygen's being consumed, CO2 is being produced, but so is some metabolic water, which connects into the water budget. And the organism is also producing some uh, nitrogenous waste and many species will actually dilute that or, or um, dissolve that into water before they transport it to the environment. So that is also part of the water budget you see here. And then we have um, the, the process of taking food in, using some of it to um, run the metabolism and that, that generates a cost, the metabolic rate, but some of that is then stored as new growth, new tissue. Uh, some of it is used for reproduction. Uh, some of that is just stored as, um, as reserves for later. Um, and some of it is lost back to the environment as feces. And this also connects to the water budget because usually feces have water in them. So there's a loss of water with the feces and usually food has water in it. So there's a gain of water with the food. So that scheme um, of connecting all those different processes of energy and mass exchange, they stick together in this beautiful way and actually makes the whole thing less complex, uh, in fact, than if you were trying to do all those things separately, you get um, more things for free basically by connecting all these things together. And the physical principles of thermodynamics tells us how to connect those things together. And each one of these terms has in it functional traits that we can measure about the organism, like the solar reflectance of the organism, which is a functional trait in here. And also what we could call functional environments, things we must know about the environment in order to um, understand what those terms are. So obviously solar radiation would be one of the, um, the terms in the solar um, term of the budget here. So essentially, this is the scheme that allows us to understand niches mechanistically and allow us to map them to the landscape to predict where species can and can't be. Um, and the theory to do all of this has existed for a long time. Uh, it, it's largely contained in these three books, um, one called Biophysical, Biophysical Ecology by David Gates. And this really um, has a lot of information about heat um, exchange between organisms in their environment and also water. And then uh, there's this book called Environmental Biophysics by um, Galen Campbell and John Norman. Galen Campbell is an excellent soil scientist and, and it's a really great book about microclimates, although it's more than just microclimates um, and a really accessible book, but there's so much in it. Um, I keep going back to this book. Um, and then this book on the right is the, about the dynamic energy budget theory, which is a scheme that allows the metabolism to be characterized from first principles using physics. And I'll say a little bit about all of these. Um, I'll get to the dynamic energy budget theory right at the end. What I'm trying to do here in this talk is just give you a flavor and overview of what all these um, theories can do when combined together as a mechanistic niche model. And I certainly can't cover it comprehensively in this time. Now, each of these books, you could, you could spend a few lectures on at least. But what I'm hoping is that, um, through explaining these concepts, first of all, and then showing how we can apply these concepts with the niche mapper package, which I'll mention in a moment, um, you'll at least get a sense of whether or not you'll find this something useful for your own research. But I hope that also through thinking of the organism in the way that I've just been explaining, you might actually just find it a beneficial way to think of an organism, even if you don't actually apply it. Um, and uh, what, I, what I'm talking about next in the, in the um, Niche mapper package, and also just generally in terms of the concepts I've been talking about, I've been standing on the shoulders of these two particular giants to actually do any of this. Um, Warren Porter and, and Bas Kuhlman. Warren Porter, with David Gates, who wrote Biophysical Ecology, was the founder of biophysical ecology as a, as a field um, and was really pioneering the application of physical principles to understand heat budgets of organisms. And Bas Kuhlman, um, is a real pioneer in trying to understand the metabolism from first principles. And uh, so, yeah, so really uh, we, we owe a lot to these two scientists in, in working out the underlying theory to do all of these things. And what I've spent a lot of time doing over the past 
roughly you know, almost 20 years now is trying to take all of these things and put them together in a, in, a, in a useful way so that we can use them. Because I certainly found when I started trying to do this, I wanted to do this, but there, the tools to do it were very clunky and difficult and it, and it, and it, wasn't, um, it wasn't easy. Um, but then the R environment came around and, and we all became very familiar with coding in that environment. And it's extremely powerful for getting our data together and for visualizing our data. So I've put this whole scheme into, into the R environment. And this package has a whole lot of different aspects to it um, that I'll, I'll be touching on. So there's the microclimate model. Um, there's a model for understanding heat budgets and water budgets of ectotherms. Sort of ancillary to that are some um, models for looking at water exchange of eggs and also just generally understanding water exchange of organisms, some sort of helper functions that link to the ectotherm model, which I won't say much more about in this talk. Uh, then there's the endotherm model, um, which is essentially doing what the ectotherm model is doing, solving a heat budget, um, but actually it's a bit different when you do it for an endotherm. And then finally, the dynamic energy budget model um, are all uh, in the package and connected in various ways. So starting with microclimates, I mentioned that Australia was the, the first place to get climate layers, macroclimate layers. And I was puzzled about this because the, the, the technology, the, the methods that were used to develop these layers were actually developed in the States by, in the United States by uh, a, a woman called Grace Waba, actually at the University of Wisconsin where Warren Porter is. Um, but it was first applied in Australia and I asked Mike Hutchinson, who was the first to do this, why we had the layers before anyone else. And he pointed out that Australia had um, quite large areas without weather stations. In the UK, the US, um, in Europe, you got lots and lots of weather stations. We had vast areas without them. And so we needed to interpolate between. And so that's why the, the technology was applied first in Australia, but then to the rest of the world. But basically, um, this is super powerful. It enables, enables us to have gridded information at fine resolution about the climate. But this is coming from weather station observations, of course. And so typically the air temperature is being measured in a box like this, a Stevenson screen, so that, it, so that it's high enough above the ground to get away from the local effects and says something more about the general atmosphere. But um, what we want to know about when we're studying organisms is the climate near the organism, and that's microclimate, um, often called, well, has been called the climate near the ground, which is what this very classic book on microclimates is called. And it's complicated. This is a scene from where that military dragon was. Here's that military dragon picture again. Um, it's just uh, sitting out in this spin effect sand plane. You can see an area has been burnt and is quite open. And you can see in the right hand side, the temperatures in that burnt area, the surface temperature is getting uh, well over 50 degrees. Uh, and then where the, where the spin effects tussocks are, um, it can be down to 32 degrees in the deep shade where you know, this lizard is, is retreating. So hugely complex through space and through time. And you might think it's, it's a hopeless um, task to try and model this variation, but it turns out that you can actually do it in a way that's biologically useful and, and accurate. And just to give you an example, um, here is a um, prediction and observation of soil temperatures, um, hourly soil temperatures across a few years uh, from somewhere in Australia. Um, red is observed and the black is predicted. And this top graph is for three centimetres underground and, the, and the, the one below is for 15 centimetres. And you can see there's a really tight match between observed and predicted soil temperatures. And that can only happen if the whole system is, is being accurately predicted in terms of the, the, the forcing above ground and the way that that's being transferred underground. And so um, this is quite a good test of the overall capacity for us to make predictions of microclimates. And these predictions were made by taking macroclimatic information and transforming it into microclimatic information. It was not trained on any data. It was just done with the physics and knowing all the appropriate um, characteristics of the site. Um, the microclimate model underneath all of this was originally developed by Warren Porter and his engineering colleagues back in the 60s and 70s when they were using um, Fortran as the language. That's a very fast um, language, but it's a, it's a clunky language to code in, and it was particularly clunky back then because they were using punch cards to start off with. But um, it comprises a whole series of subroutines all stuck together that allow us to calculate the dynamics of how the environment changes through time on an hourly basis, given properties of that habitat. And so um, 
you send in information about the weather conditions at a site to this scheme, um, it will calculate how, if you give it maximum and minimum temperatures, and that's all you know, it has routines to calculate how that should cycle through the day relative to sunrise and sunset. Um, and that's because it has algorithms that compute the solar radiation from first principles, knowing your position on the globe. Um, so it's got a, a, a solar radiation cal a calculation that's starting with the solar constant, how much uh, solar radiation is hitting the outer atmosphere of the Earth, and then works out how that's transmitted through the atmosphere given the time of day, how much atmosphere it's passing through, and then other aspects of the atmosphere, including cloud and um, ozone and so on. Um, it's also able to incorporate in a sophisticated way how the, um, the, the shade is affecting the environmental conditions, both in terms of the effect on solar radiation, but also on the long wave radiation environment. It has um, algorithms for working out how the, the structure of the terrain affects the way the wind blows across the landscape and how that affects um, how wind speed changes with height above the ground and how that affects how air temperature changes with height above the ground. And then it has um, calculations for the, the way that the heat is transferring in through the soil through time that can be explicit about the thermal properties of that soil, um, the conductivity, the heat capacity, um, and aspects like the, sol the, the, um, uh, the, the albedo and, and so on. Um, I've also added into this package the capacity to model soil moisture. So how soil is infiltrating into the, um, so how moisture is infiltrating into the soil. That's happening a lot around me right now. We're having um, record rains at the moment. The whole of my state and town is underwater right now. A whole lot of people are, are being evacuated from towns. The water is actually filled up, um, completely filled up the, uh, the, the capacity for the soil to hold it and it's all running off. But there are models for how water infiltrates into the soil. And then of course, that's important for a lot of um, calculating a lot of important things relevant to organism survival, like plant growth and how um, water exchange of the organism with the, with the substrate. Um, but it also affects the temperature, the way the temperature of the soil evolves because um, the moisture causes a, a damping of the effects of um, the, the, the heat load and also um, uh, yeah, reduces the temperature. And then I've also added the capacity to calculate um, snow, how it builds up on top of the, of the surface and, uh, and influences the temperature of the substrate. So it's actually calculating not just how much snow there is, but what that snow does to the temperature of the soil. So all of that is in Fortran, but in R you can call Fortran and take advantage of Fortran's power. And so what Niche Mapper does is take that Fortran code uh, and, and wrap it up in a function that you can pass information to and then get information back out. Um, and so you can give it information from various sources about the climate. Um, the simplest function in the package is called microglobal, and that's using a global data set of monthly long-term averages. So the conditions for the middle day in January, um, February, March, averaged over uh, 1960 to 1990. So you can send that information in. Um, as well as information about your site. So what's, uh, what's your location in the globe? What, what's, the, what's the terrain like? What's the slope and aspect? Um, what's the shade? What's the soil type? And then it extracts the information from the databases. So from the, the climate data set, the global climate data set, which comes from uh, the um, New et al publication in 2002. Uh, it also has a soil moisture data set that it can draw from if you don't want to calculate the soil moisture from first principles. And then it also uh, queries a uh, global data set on aerosols, which is basically dust and things like that in the atmosphere and how they vary across space to affect the um, solar radiation levels. And I realized that was important because when I was doing calculations for Australia to start off with, I was getting underestimates of solar radiation. And that's because the model was sort of had built in um, aerosols from the US where there was a region where there was quite a bit of pollution and it was making like a 15% difference to the estimates of solar radiation. So it can be quite important. Um, so that model crunches through and does all those calculations and gives you um, outputs of the conditions that we need to know to solve those heat and water budgets above and below ground. So there are outputs saying what's the wind speed and the air temperature and the humidity at the height of the animal of interest. Um, there's also output saying what's the soil temperature at different depths, what's the soil moisture at different depths, 
uh, and even what's the humidity and, and water potential of the soil as well at different depths. And that's um, uh, that uh, microclimate model has been described in detail in a uh, the first of three papers describing the niche mapper package, all, all published in ecography. Um, so you can have a look at that to get at the details of it, of the package and how, how the microclimate model works. Um, and there are also some uh, apps that I've made that allow you to play around with the model without actually having to use R and, and know too much about the model, um, just to get a sense of what it can do and see whether it's something you might find useful. I'll just quickly flick to this, just to give you a little demo. Um, so there's a, there's a landing page for all these shiny apps. There are a few of them. Um, and the one we're wanting to look at here, I've called the Global Soil Microclimate Calculator. So if I click on that, it's really um, more than just soil, of course, but it, but you know, that's that's one of the key things you can get out of this. So it's just it's actually running when you when you use this app. It's actually running the microclimate model on a server here in Melbourne. So it's actually downloading some information about the um, the terrain at the moment, and now it's running the model and it's given us a prediction. And the prediction is for quite a famous place in Australia, Uluru. You can see the picture here of Uluru. It's this big sandstone rock. Um, it's an important place for the Anugu people, Anugu Pitjantjara people of Central Australia. You can see this is the site here. Um, the marker is a bit weird. It should be a, a little point like this, but it's a square for some reason. But it's right on the edge of the rock here. Um, and so it's calculating the environmental conditions and it's being explicit about this terrain. So it's got the slope and the aspect of that point and it's even got the angle to the horizon caused by that rock being in the way, which is what these dots are here. And then it's showing you what the calculation is for the soil temperature at different depths in the typical day in January at that site. That's what this plot is. So you've got soil temperature on the y-axis an hour of the day on the x and you can see uh, this is sunrise here. When the sun rises, the soil temperature rises in January from about 20 degrees up to a maximum of about 50 and then declines. And then you can see the soil temperature as you go deeper um, is more damped and the peak is happening a bit later in the day. And if I scroll down, you can see predictions of the air temperature um, both at the weather station height, which is what the, the global climate database was giving us, and that's been interpolated to hourly. Um, but also the temperature at the height of interest here, which is one centimetre above the ground, which is the black line, which is warmer during the day uh, and colder at night. And then the same with the wind speed. The dashed blue line is the wind speed up at the weather station height, which is higher um, in general than down near the ground. Uh, the humidity is on the um, top right of these four plots and then the solar radiation down the bottom. And you can see at this uh, this is the solar radiation going up through the day and suddenly it stops. And that's because the rock is blocking the sun. But we can actually change the, a whole lot of things about the way the model runs here. If we click on this show terrain and soil parameters, you can change the shade and the slope and the aspect from what it's gotten from the digital elevation model and various other things. There's a checkbox to use that digital elevation model, which I'm going to turn off and then reset all these things so that it's basically going to be zero slope, zero shade and no rock in the way. So you see with the rock in the way, the soil was getting up to 50 degrees maximum. I'm going to rerun the model and we'll see that it actually gets way above 60 um, and, and is warmer for more of the day. So it just gives you an example of the sort of calculations you can make um, with the microclimate model. And if um, you you can actually click on the save input output and, and save the parameters, but you can also get CSV files of the output and you can even save the R script to then run that in your R environment, uh, exactly how you ran it on the in the app. Um, okay, so I'll go back to presentation. Um, okay, so that's the microclimate model, and I think I'm I'm going to need to hurry up here. Um, so I won't show any more examples of the shiny apps, but we can look at those later if you like. But now to the Oh, I, I should also say that there are all these different functions in the, mic, in the microclimate model, um, but they're all really just using different environmental data sets. So there's the microglobal one, but there's one specifically for the USA, one specifically for New Zealand and so on. But there's also some very general ones that will work anywhere in the world, including Spain. Um, one of them is the micro NSEP function. And this um, I put together with Ilya McLean and um, Pippa Gillingham and 
Isabel Brammer as part of a little workshop on microclimates where we realized there were all these tools that we could stick together, including Ilya's um, microclimate package, um, a package that allows you to download this NCEP data, which is um, for the whole world um, uh, back to, I think, 1950, um, relatively coarse resolution. So there's this RNCEP package. There's um, Ilya's microclimate package, which allows us to downscale uh, the course NCEP data to, with some clever um, routines to get to go towards mesoclimate from, from this really broad climate. Um, so we get these mesoclimate surfaces with microclimate and then this Elevate R package can just tell us the, elevate, the digital elevation model for anywhere in the world. Uh, you can even get sea surface temperature if you're trying to account for effects of coastal breezes, which Ilya's package can do. Um, and then we can use all that together, send that into the niche mapper package and make time series of um, the conditions like you saw in the app uh, for anywhere in the world um, and almost like a time machine anywhere into the past. And then if you want, you can use Ilya's package to make um, in, in integration with the niche mapper package to make fine resolution maps of the landscape as well. Um, so that was a bit of a breakthrough and, and um, and then uh, soon after that, the era five data set came out, which is even better. And there's a function to connect to that as well. And I think this is the way to go from now on for anywhere in the world is the era five function, um, the era five data set. So we can make these calculations of microclimates anywhere now. And of course, we can project those to the future as well by hooking this um, scheme into future climates. So then we want to know what will happen to the organisms. And you know, we have two broad types of organisms from a heat transfer point of view, ectotherms and endotherms. And there's a lot going on in terms of heat and water exchange in these organisms, um, as illustrated by another figure that it, um, Aaliyah made. So we've got all these different terms relating to the heat budget. Um, there's convection, uh, there's, there's radiation, um, both long wave and solar. There's evaporation, conduction, and there's all these processes of water exchange going on too, as I was mentioning before, exchange of water through the breath, water evaporating from the surface, coming out of the eye, but the ectotherm model does all those uh, calculations, adds them all up and finds what that implies about the temperature of the organism in a particular environment. Um, and once we have that, we can then plug in what we know about the physiology, things like the, the limits to survival, critical minimum and maximum limits to survival, um, and then also the behavioural limits um, that organisms forage between uh, retreat um, and retreat at. And um, you know, the behaviour is quite complex. Um, it's been well known for a long time that ectotherms can use behaviour and the variation in their microclimates to regulate their body temperatures quite um, accurately. Um, and this is a diagram illustrating that for a dragon like the, the military dragon showing that at a certain temperature, it will emerge from its retreat. Uh, it will then um, come out and bask for, for a while. And then once it's warm enough, it will venture away from its retreat and do things like mate and feed. But as it gets too hot during the day, then it will eventually retreat um, into the shade and, and um, hopefully not, not get too hot and die. Um, and so the, the ectotherm model not only does those calculations of the body temperature, but also, and, and the associated implications for water loss, but also incorporates all of those sorts of behaviors. So you can tell the model uh, the behavioral characteristics as well as the physical and um, the physiological and, and morphological characteristics to solve the heat budget. So it takes as input the output from the microclimate model um, and uses those intersecting uh, energy and mass balance equations uh, to make a calculation and then gives you outputs in terms of what environment the animal would have selected in that location, what would the, um, the energy balance be, what are the different fluxes, and then what would the mass, mass balance be, how much water was it losing in particular. Um, and then you can make maps of, for instance, the potential activity time of the species through the year, which is what this figure depicts, where it's showing the hour of the day and the day of the year, the black or the dark colour being night hours, the light blue where the animal is out and basking but not foraging, and the gold showing where it's foraging. And this is for a southern hemisphere site where um, it's summertime at the beginning of the year and its activity window is large and then it shrinks down in the winter time to, to disappear because it's too cold and then you'll see them emerge again and start foraging. Um, and so inside, so this again is a Fortran um, 
was based on a Fortran program that's basically doing all those calculations of all those terms. This is a little look at what it's like inside. So there are functions for doing radiation, convection, evaporation, respiration, metabolism, um, and, and conduction. There are functions for working out the properties of air um, associated with all of this and for, for working out the solar radiation. And of course, this is all driven by geometry, surface area and volume relationships. And there's a whole lot of calculations of surface areas and volumes in one of the algorithms here. And the way you solve all of this is you find the body temperature that balances this heat, heat balance equation so that everything coming in equals everything going out. That has to happen for a temperature that will balance the heat budget. And that is the ultimate temperature the organism would have in that, in that view and over and over again in different habitats depending on what the animal can do whether it can come out during the day um, and so yeah what, I, what this is just without the behavior and then there's a whole lot of um, algorithms that it uses to incorporate the behavior as well Um, so you to play around with this and, and um, uh, just get a feel for how it works. Um, but of course, you can run it in R and control it. And if you have time and interest, I can do a quick demo of the um, ectotherm app. Uh, endotherms, and it's very typically from. Terms, except that we've got a fur coat, usually like rates. This is a P exchange generally apply, and we can use these biophysical principles to predict way and also differently because endotherms are generally homeotherms and keeping the core temperature constant. So we're not solving for body temperature because that's that's staying constant. But of course, what's happening as endotherms get cold is they raise their metabolic rate um, so that they can keep their body temperature at a certain level. Um, so this is a plot of ambient temperature rather than body temperature and requirements in terms of energy in blue. Um, at some point, the the water loss rate is going out because the organism is having to dump heat somehow. Uh, and so generally that's done by increasing the water loss rate. So what we can do with the end of the model is There you are. Sorry, Mike. Where did, I, where did I cut out, August? It seems that it seems that it started to slow down the, the speed of the of the sound and of the of the image. Your signal seemed to be okay. to slow to become slower or something. Uh, so that's why I asked it to to maybe turn off the your camera in, in order to try and okay. And when did that happen? Where was I up to? Uh, maybe a couple of minutes ago. So had I started talking about endotherms uh, a little bit before endotherms let me let me see a slide when i 
it is start coming a bit slight, you know, not super, not super bad to understand. But yeah, at the moment of predicting endothermic energy and other what budgets was already kind of bad. Okay, I'll I'll go from there. All right. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay, and I'll just yeah. let you yeah. off my are we, video. Are we still stream and everything, right? Yes, we are still streaming. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, I'll stop my video. Me too. Okay, apologies for the break in transmission. Um, I think, let me just. Coming good now. Okay. Okay, so I think where um, the, the connection broke down was where I started to talk about endotherms. And I was just saying that solving a heat budget for an endotherm isn't totally different. You can use the same equations, but we're thinking of an organism that is now regulating uh, a constant body temperature, has a high metabolic rate and, and has some insulation, um, as indicated by this cute photo by Raymond Cowles years ago. Um, so what we're thinking about with endotherms is, yeah, maintaining a constant core temperature as environments vary. So this is the ambient temperature now on the X axis. And as it gets colder, endotherms raise their metabolic rate to keep warm. Um, and as it gets warmer, they have to use extra water and they're trying to ideally stay in a zone that minimizes their energy and water loss. But when necessary, um, they will have to in enhance their energy intake or their water usage. And the biophysical models can tell us how much they have to do this by to maintain a given core temperature in a given environment. And so in the niche mapper package, there are models of endotherms. There are, um, there's a very simple model called the ellipsoid model, which is a good one to start with. And then there's the more sophisticated full-blown endotherm model that has two versions, one for um, developing a version for your particular organism uh, and then another that's a bit slow, but easy to code in. And then another one that is um, operational that um, runs fast. Um, and so it's all described in detail in a paper from last year, also in ecography, um, the endotherm model. And um, this is a peek at its structure. And uh, you can see that it's got some terms relating to solar radiation, convection and evaporation. Um, like the ectotherm model. Um, it's also got a geometry subroutine and the properties of air. Um, so uh, it's got this, uh, it's got some information about fur here because we have to worry about the in insulation and how heat's transferring through the insulation. And that's where it gets quite complicated. And this routine here called Simulsol, which is really the, um, the amazing part of it that Warren worked out, Warren Porter worked out for how to simultaneously get the skin temperature and the fur temperature um, and, the, and that, that balances the whole heat budget. Uh, it's, it's really quite a sophisticated algorithm and there's nothing else really out there that can do this kind of calculation. So it's really quite powerful, but quite, quite challenging to get your head around. But you don't really need to get your head around it. You just need to know what, roughly what it's doing. And the general concept of how it's operating, which is it is calculating for a given environment, what must the metabolic rate be? It's solving for the metabolic rate that balances the heat budget in that environment. If it's a cold environment, it will just say, okay, it has to be elevated by this amount. If it's, if it's cold enough to make it higher than basal metabolic rate, then that's your answer. Um, and you get, you get the output and you know how much energy it costs to survive in that particular environment. But if it's getting hot, um, it actually, it actually can't drop its metabolic rate below basal. And if it's actually, if you're interested in, in an animal foraging, then it, 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 if it's, if it's uh, you, you can say, well, where would it be too hot for it to actually have a metabolic rate uh, that enables it to forage? And then the model will try and do some things to, to dump the excess heat so that it, its metabolic rate can be um, a a, a, an allowable metabolic rate of the one you specified. And it can do that by, perhaps behaving, changing its shape or shade or um, depth on the ground or height above the ground, and it can change posture. But then it can also start to do physiological things like change the conductivity of the flesh. It can let the core temperature go up a bit. Many animals will allow that to some extent. Um, it can pant or it can start to sweat. Um, so what the model's doing is, um, if it's too hot, it's trying out these various things to see 
what is possible to allow it to, to um, persist and be at that specified core temperature in a given habitat. And doing so will tell you, you know, how, how much water it needed to lose um, as a result. So to, just to give you a, a quick example of, of that in practice, this is a, a paper led by um, Nat Briscoe looking at cats in Australia and, and their impact on native wildlife. And we were wondering, are there places that are physiologically too difficult for cats in Australia? And so we applied this scheme and asked, where in Australia is it too hard for cats? Now, cats are really widespread across um, all environments in Australia, um, and they're a desert creature. But we wondered whether there might be some situations where there's no, you know, it's, it's too difficult for them because they don't have the right um, microclimates, basically, to persist. So we've connected um, information on microclimates with um, different scenarios that we set up for the cats active on the surface, inactive on the surface with access to shade, inactive up a tree or down a burrow. And then we calculated what that would mean for their um, water balance, basically, to see if we incorporate how much water they'd be losing and account for how much water they might be gaining from their food and by rain, where could they be? And um, we tested it out against data that we collected on cats in the wild. And this is an example of observed and predicted burrow use. The black is uh, observed where it goes up there in a burrow at different dates. And the red is where we, the black is predicted, I should say, and the red is when we observe them to be in burrows from radio tracking studies. And it tends to work quite well. Um, and uh, then we mapped that to the landscape and asked how does um, the harshness of the environment vary in different years under different scenarios. So the top two figures are showing a mild year and a hot year, showing how, uh, how desiccated cats would be if they had access to burrows. And you can see, generally speaking, nowhere is that stressful um, if they had access to burrows. But if we take the burrows away, even in a mild year, but certainly in a hot year, uh, there are a whole lot of areas where they'd be losing 10% of their body mass over, over a period of a week, which would probably be lethal. And so they could not be in those areas. And if we add the consecutive number of days where it is um, un unbearably hot, we get a map that looks like this over, over about a 20 year period. And this is where we'd expect ca cats to have a very hard time in Australia if there were not um, any burrows. And when we look at a whole lot of um, cute, furry and feathery mammals that have been driven to uh, endangered uh, status by cats, the bilby, the mulgara and the night parrot. Um, the places where they're persisting, which are the black dots, tend to be within this zone, but the places where we've lost them, which are the, um, the, the purple squares, are um, in the places where the cats could be okay without access to burrows. So this is an example of how we can actually use these models to do something practical on the ground, knowing what the mechanisms are potentially controlling access to burrows for cats in reserves. Okay, now I've only got one last section to go and it's a, it's a pretty heavy section and I'm really just gonna glance over it, but that's the dynamic energy budget theory. And all I'll say about this is that it allows us to fully capture that whole, the whole metabolism of the organism through its ontogeny. Um, and that allows us to get at really interesting things about phenology, how, how the, what happens at the beginning of the life cycle connects to later stages in the life cycle, how a stressful event at one stage can feed through um, to another stage or how the timing of when an organism is born relates to the, um, the stage that it's at when a stress hits or when, when good conditions hit. And it's fully physical and it connects beautifully with the energy and mass uh, budgeting that the biophysical models do. And basically gives us this part here of the interconnected scheme of energy and mass budget equations and this part here. Um, so they fit perfectly together. They tell each other things that they need, the biophysical and the metabolic theory. Um, and and, and uh, we're only really starting to touch the surface of how what we can do when these two things are combined. Um, but it's, it's, I think, a really exciting area. This theory has been around for a while, but only sort of in a practical sense can it be applied because we have parameters now for lots of species. And since 2016, the number of species with parameters has gone up to about over 3,500 now. So it's really um, applicable. And there's a shiny app that you can play around with um, the dynamic energy budget um, model as well, if you like. So yeah, I've taken a little bit um, longer than I hoped, um, but 
what I hope to have explained to you is, is this notion of how we can take thermodynamic ideas about energy and mass budgets and link them to what we understand about the biology of organisms and their microhabitats, how we have the theory to do this um, and how there are models like Niche Mapper and others that are uh, emerging that will allow us to do this in a practical way. And uh, as I said, you might find that this is something you might want to do in your research, or you might find that just learning about this theory helps you to think differently about your organism and, uh, and ask perhaps different questions that you might have otherwise. It certainly did for me. If you are interested in going further with this, um, there are resources, uh, including a website that, it, that sort of gives an overview of the package. And um, also there's a Google group that you can join um, that uh, if you have questions about the package, I try to be really quick on answering those so that everyone benefits. So I hope that was of interest and useful and thanks for your time and thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, well, I think this, this has been a wonderful presentation of how something that can be absolutely complicated at first can be, can be you know, reduced to very, very simple steps and then take back and, and put everything together to be able to make predictions. And uh, not, not so recently, a few years ago, I was, I was starting using this, this package that you have designed and I was like, okay, let's look at if this really is able to predict temperatures in a, in a very remote place from the place that uh, it has been prepared. And we were, we were actually, uh, you know, comparing the temperatures in a, in a pond here in, in, in Andalusia and man, it worked. It's, it's like, you feel like, well, this, this is like science that works. You can really predict things uh, on a absolutely different context from, from which it was uh, constructed. So, so I'm very, I'm very interested in, in keep on using this, this package that you're preparing. And uh, okay, so I have, we're still, we're already having a couple of questions in the, in the chat. So I'm going to start passing them to you. Okay, Mike? No problem. Uh, so we have here Xavier, Xavier Picot Mercader, who, who, is, who is commenting about this. Um, he says, environmental data are normally especially autocorrelated. Is that a problem to make predictions with niche mapper, I guess? If so, how do you deal with that? Thank you. Oh, so yeah, so if, if things are, if you're trying to model things statistically, yeah, you have to worry about autocorrelation and, and collinearity and that sort of thing. Um, in this, this kind of model, no, it's not, it's not a problem because what you really, what you're wanting is um, accurate estimates of the actual conditions that link into those equations. So that's what's most important. Um, so you, you need a, because you're actually doing all this uh, calculating to actually get the body temperature and to connect that to actual measured physiology, we can't use indices. We have to have the accurate estimates of the conditions. So that's really what the challenge is. But the correlation is not a problem. And in fact, these models will give you the spatial autocorrelate. Well, I mean, I, I think, I think you're, yeah, I, I think I know what you're asking and hopefully I'm answering the question. It, it, these models will, will kind of give you the reasons why you get spatial autocorrelation in variables through time because it's linked to all those physical processes. Um, it, will, it will show you why, um, well, yeah, it, it, it will show you how all these things interact to affect an organism uh, rather than having to try and disentangle them from looking at statistical associations between the, the environmental variables and the organism. So um, it's a different, it, it has its own challenges. That's not one of them, but it, um, but it does have, have challenges. Um, and the main thing is to be accurate. All right. Uh, okay. Another question that we have from Laetitia Navarro is, is the following. Uh, he, her question is about the use of climate change scenarios within this, this modeling framework. Uh, so her question is, are those large scale scenarios comprehensive enough for the data to be applied in the microclimate model? Yeah, so the, the uh, climate change scenarios will typically give you um, changes in the monthly, you know, monthly temperatures, the monthly rainfall. So you can uh, impose those on um, present day conditions, right? So that's, that's the way we tend to do this. Um, there is a data set uh, called MicroTerra, which has recently come out, um, developed by John Abbott Zoglu, I think is how you say his surname. He's made a whole lot of fantastic resources that, in, 
that being one of them. And it has uh, a data set, a global data set of climate change scenarios of a plus two and a plus four degree warming globally. But that's, you know, it, it, the, the data set is how that general plus four degree warming translates across space. So not it won't be plus four everywhere. Um, and it includes uh, vapor pressure changes, I think, as well as rainfall, as well as temperature. So there is a, if you use the micro inset or the micro era five function, um, you can say impose the micro terra climate change scenario and it will just do it um, automatically and you'll get the, the effect of that particular climate change, change scenario imposed on the historical conditions. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Duarte Viana and he, he wants to thank you for the insightful presentation. And his question is, what's the minimal number of parameters of the animal or species traits that are needed to get the model to work? Are these easy to measure? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so you could roughly get the temperature of say a lizard just by knowing its rough body size. And you, know, you can assume it's a cylinder for instance, so you can not necessarily um, have to have the details of its surface area. You're probably just assuming it was a cylinder knowing its mass, knowing the, the length of the thing relative to the width. Um, and you could probably just assume that its absorptivity was about 0.8. Um, and if you know, um, you know, and then you can work out its height above the ground, that's pretty straightforward. Just knowing those things would allow you to get a pretty good estimate of the body temperature in a particular place, assuming you've got all the microclimate right. Um, where you need start to need more information is when you wanna see how it, um, would behave. So then you need the, the physiological threshold. So that's the next level of set of parameters where you might want the upper and lower tem temperatures for foraging. Um, and then, you know, if you want to understand the water loss, then you might need to know what the um, resistance of the skin is to water. So it, it, it depends on what your question is, but if you simply want to ask how hot would an organism, an ectotherm get in a particular environment, you don't need that much. Um, but yeah, the more processes you add, there's at least, you know, going to be at least one parameter per process, if you think of it that way. Thank you. Uh, I, have a one, I have one question of, my, from my, of mine, actually. Uh, so when I have been, I have been measuring this, uh, some, some thermal tolerant measures, which is uh, one thing that we have found is that they, they change a lot depending on the, on the environmental context. For example, when you uh, something that you probably you already know, which is that when you change the rate of warming, you sometimes get different estimates of thermal tolerance, which is related to the to the time that the animals oh, yeah. tolerate yeah. thermal stress. I was wondering if there is any any initiative to to introduce this sort of variation in thermal traits in thermal tolerance traits uh, within the uh, within the your framework. So that. Um... So what I talked about mainly were steady state calculations of, um, of heat budgets. So that's basically imagining you press pause on the environment and you let everything sort of come to the steady state. Um, but, you know, if, uh, when an animal is becoming heat stressed, it could be happening over a very short time scale if it gets forced out into the sun from the shade. Um, so, it, you know, the dynamics of the body temperature change is what this model is giving you. And what I described will just give you the steady state and not the, the slow change that a massive organism might have because of its thermal inertia or the, or the change in uh, the rates of change that you get in, 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 in on shorter time scales than an hour. Um, but there are functions in the niche mapper package to do transient heat budgets mm -hmm. so that you, there's a, it's called one lump and um, one, yeah, one lump is basically what you want to look for. Um, and, and that will allow you to get that dynamics of the rate at, at fine scales. But then it's as far as what you do with that, that's the theory about the, you know, the, therm the, the thermal death time curves or whatever they're called. And, the, and, and, you know, like the, the integration of the intensity and duration of the stress that is outside of the model. You, you use, you would use the body temperatures from the model, and then you would apply that physiological theory, whatever your theory is. Um, so in that sense, uh, yes, you can use this system to ask that sort of question, but, and, but you might need the transient model to answer certain of those questions about rates of warming. Um, if, if you're thinking about the animal in its retreat 
underground, then the soil temperatures that the model's predicting are going to be very much like what the animal would experience. So you don't need the transient model. Same if they're just sitting like in the shade and they're just warming up with the with the day. Um, so it's more when they're sort of venturing out into a completely different environment all of a sudden where you really need the transient model or if they're quite a large organism and you need to worry about thermal inertia. All right. All right. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to play a little with that. Um, okay, thank you very much, Mike. We, are, we, have, we have passed through, through our normal time for, for seminars, but I really wanted to, to go through the questions and everything because they will have several people to, to make questions. But, but yeah, I think that we can, we can finish if nobody else is appearing. Not, not that I see on the YouTube. So, so thanks, thanks to for everybody to to be here and, and watch this seminar. And thanks to you, Mike, Mike, a lot for 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 holding on and 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 be patient with with these technical difficulties. Uh, no problem. Yeah. So thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks to you. And so thanks to everybody. And see you see you all next week. We can all finish the presentation.